All right, here's our review. Let's jump right in. In terms of the kinetic model, define the terms heat, temperature, and pressure. Okay, so we have heat, temperature, just going to abbreviate, and pressure. So for heat, heat is the total kinetic energy of all particles. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of all the particles. So that has more to do with like the energy per particle. And pressure is the force from the collisions of particles with the sides of a container or a surface or something like that. So. <clears throat> Those are our definitions. The unit for each heat we measure in joules because it is a type of energy. Temperature we measure in degrees Celsius or Kelvin. There are no degrees Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. The difference between those two is that Celsius starts at negative 273 and goes up from there, whereas Kelvin starts off at zero and goes up from there. Kelvin is our absolute temperature scale, meaning that it's giving us a better indication of average energy from zero. Uh, and then pressure, we use Pascals. Pascal is a Newton per meter squared. Because uh, pressure is force over area. List three ways in which the pressure of a gas container can be increased. If we're sticking with this definition uh, for force, to increase pressure, we need to increase the number of collisions with the surface, and we need to increase the force of the collisions. So the three changes we make are going to have to do those things. So we can, we can increase the number of particles. That's going to give me, um, that's going to give me more collisions. We can, We can add heat to our gas. That's going to both increase the number of collisions and the force on the collisions, and we can reduce the volume. What that does is give each particle less time to move around before it heats again, before it hits again. That's going to increase the number of collisions. Those are the things that we can do to increase pressure. List and describe the differences between the three temperature scales. So we have Kelvin, that's the big one. This one is absolute. Starts off at zero, goes to ice um, at 273 Kelvin. That's where water freezes. And then 373 Kelvin is boiling water. But it's an absolute scale. Zero is the lowest that we have. And we've got Celsius, or degrees Celsius. We measure this in degrees. It's not absolute, but it's based on the freezing points of water. So zero degrees Celsius is freezing and the boiling point of water. 100 degrees Celsius is boiling and negative 273 degrees Celsius is absolute zero. And then there's Fahrenheit, which is just strange. And weird Fahrenheit is based on, okay, well the story I think might be a little bit apocryphal, but the, the degrees Fahrenheit is based on zero degrees being something very strange like the the sort of baseline temperature for a mixture of ammonia and ice and salt all mixed together. But what that really does is make 32 degrees Fahrenheit freezing water. 100 Fahrenheit is close to body temperature. Eh. Um, 
212 Fahrenheit degrees Fahrenheit, that's boiling water. What's really uh, kind of important is that Kelvin and Celsius have the same scale. So moving up one degree Kelvin is the same thing as moving up one degree Celsius. They just start at a different uh, spot. The SI temperature scale is Kelvin because life is good that way. Absolute zero is the lowest possible temperature. That is the temperature at which kinetic energy drops down to zero. We have not gotten there. So zero Kelvin is like saying zero kinetic energy of particles. That's why it's absolute. It means that absolutely. First law of thermodynamics is conservation of energy or work in equals work out. What this tells us is that efficiency for a heat engine never exceeds 100%. We can't get 110% efficiency. It doesn't work that way. You only get the work out that you put in. Write the equation for efficiency. Efficiency is work out over work in times 100%. Why can we never be greater than 100%? Machines or engines do not make extra energy. You only get out what you put in. Define the second law of thermodynamics and define the term entropy. List four consequences of the law. So the second law of thermodynamics is that um, natural systems, sorry, yes, why yes. tends toward greater entropy. And entropy is just another way of saying disorder. That is our little definition for entropy. Uh, our consequences I don't want to say it that way. We always have less than One hundred percent efficiency. Heat moves from hot to cold, uh, and then heat is always lost to surroundings. And then our last consequence is that all energy will eventually become heat. That's going to happen in a long time, so don't, don't worry about that. What factors can affect the efficiency of a heat engine? So if we're, if we're looking at that... It's the temperature difference between the engine and the surroundings. Because heat is always lost to surroundings, we can't ever get to 100%. It's always going to leak out. We're always going to lose heat in this thing. When do two objects transfer heat between them? Uh, one is when they are in contact. We'll say it's thermal contact. Uh, and the other is um, if there is a temperature difference. 
What is the condition called when they do not transfer heat? And what we're going to say is net transfer of heat. Um, that condition is thermal equilibrium. At thermal equilibrium, the objects have the same temperature. Our three methods of heat transfer are conduction, convection, and radiation. For conduction, we have direct contact. That's like touching a warm stove. For convection, what you have is fluid currents heating the fluid. And then for radiation, you have light energy. That's how the sun heats us. It's not directly touching us. It's putting out light energy. What is the term specific heat? It refers to an object's ability to retain heat. And what it is is the energy... per kilogram degree Celsius. So how much energy it takes to raise a kilogram a degree Celsius. That's the specific heat. What common material has a high specific heat? Water is a particularly good insulator. It takes a lot of energy to change water. List four factors that determine how much heat is transferred. Three factors, sorry. That determine how much heat is transferred between the two objects. And the mass of the objects, the temperature difference, Specific heat. Write an equation for finding the amount of heat transferred for, between two objects. Q is equal to M, the mass, C, the specific heat, times delta T. That is our heat transfer equation. Uh, a forklift takes in 5,000 joules of energy from a gasoline engine when it lifts a 25 kilogram pallet of shrimp from the dock to the floor, four meters above the dock floor. How much work is done on the pallet of shrimp? Well, that work is the force times the distance in lifting the shrimp. The force to lift the shrimp is mg, and the distance is the distance they gave us. So 25 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared times 4 meters uh, gives me 1,000 joules of heat, and that's the work out. How much heat does the forklift produce? So what we're going to have is work in is equal to work out plus heat. The work in is 5,000 joules of energy. That equals the work out 1,000 joules plus the heat. And based on what we see here, that heat is 4,000 joules. So 4,000 joules are lost to heat and our efficiency is the work out over the work in times 100 percent. So 1,000 divided by 5,000 times 100 percent gives me 20 percent. How much energy would the forklift take in to lift a 40 kilogram pallet of red snapper to the same height? So for this one, the work out would be mg times d, so 40 times 10 times the distance of 4 meters. Uh, that gives me an output work, 40 times 10 times 4, of 1600 joules. So from our efficiency formula, 
we know we are 20% efficiency. That equals work out over work in times 100%. So 0.2 is equal to work out 1600 divided by the work in. So multiply both sides by work in. Divide both sides by 0.2. Oh, sorry. And so you get work in is equal to 1600 divided by 0.2 or 8,000 joules of work has to go in to make that happen. The efficiency of a gasoline engine is approximately 28%. How much work does the motor do if it burns that much energy in gasoline? This is my work in, this is my efficiency. So we have efficiency equals work out over work in times 100%. So we have 28% is equal to work out, which we are looking for, divided by work in, 2800 times 100%. Divide both sides by 100, 0.28 is equal to work out over 2800, multiply both sides by 2800, and the work out comes out to be 784 joules out. Again, our work out should always be less than our work in. The heat the motor produces, if we put in 2800 and we only get out 784, all the leftover is heat. So to get the leftover parts, heat is equal to work in minus work out. So 2800 minus 784, we end up with 2016 joules of heat from that. Mary uses silver to make art. She has a sample of silver whose mass is 18. How much energy must she add to raise it from 12 degrees to 28 degrees? So from here, my change in temperature is, uh, sorry, 16 degrees Celsius. We have a mass. And then for silver, our specific heat is 240 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So our heat, Q, is equal to MC delta T. So Q is equal to 1.8 times 240 times 16. And it turns out that we need 6,912 joules to affect that temperature change. If she exacts, if she only adds this much energy, what will its temperature change be? So we're gonna change it a little bit. We have the same mass, we have a new heat, and we have the same C as 240 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So we've got Q equals MC delta T. Uh, and so we have 6210 is equal to 1.8 times 240 times delta T. So to solve for delta T, we divide by 1.8 times 240. That part goes away, and so we can calculate delta T 14.4 degrees Celsius. That's the temperature change. Jimmy heats a sample of metal to 100 degrees Celsius. He puts it into a calorimeter containing water. At 15, a few minutes later, he measures the equilibrium temperature of the water to be 30. So that is the mass of our sample. That's the mass of our water. Delta T for the sample, he goes from 100 to 30. That's negative 70 degrees Celsius. Delta T for the water, we go from 15 to 30, is plus 15 degrees Celsius. Those are the things that you need. The other thing that we need is the specific heat of water, 4,180 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Pardon, 4,186 degrees joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So how much heat did the water gain? This is for the water. So we're gonna take the mass of water, five kilograms, times the specific heat of water, 4,186 joules per kilogram degree Celsius, 
times the delta T for water of 15 degrees Celsius. So the kilograms go away, the degrees Celsius go away. We're left with joules, and that Q comes out to be uh, 313,950 joules, which is a little bit, a little bit of heat. What's the specific heat of the metal? We're going to do that same equation for the metal. Q equals mc delta T. We know the Q, 313,950. We know the mass, 2 kilograms. We do not know the specific heat of the water, I'm sorry, of the metal sample, but we do know that the delta T is negative 70 degrees Celsius. Now, since the metal is losing energy, that needs to be negative. To find C, we're going to divide by 2, and we're going to divide by negative 70. So we're going to divide by negative 140, because that's what you get when you take 2 times 70. Uh, and C comes out to be 2,242.5 joules per kilogram degree Celsius.